Looking at ye old calendar, I see that we have an exam coming up, amazingly enough, a week from Friday. So I see some people nodding, kind of like, yes, we know that. Hopefully um, we get that all together. Okay, um, last time I uh, finished talking about um, de novo purine metabolism and de novo pyrimidine metabolism. Today I want to spend a little bit of time talking about catabolism, that is the uh, breaking down of uh, nucleotides. And I'll say a little bit about salvage also as, as regards purine metabolism, because purine metabolism uh, salvage actually has uh, an interesting um, genetic disease associated with it that I'll talk about. Uh, then I'll talk about, uh, just briefly, about pyrimidine uh, catabolism um, and uh, salvage there. And then we'll move on to deoxyribonucleotide metabolism. So we should be able to finish, I think, all of those topics uh, today. Well, let's start with uh, purine catabolism. So, uh, of course, catabolism, uh, you remember, is the breakdown of larger molecules into smaller components. And so when we think about catabolism of nucleotides, we uh, think then of the basically disassembling of the nucleotides. That disassembling can lead to complete breakdown, which is what I'm going to show you, or it can lead to pulling apart of bases separate from sugars, and then if the cell desires for any reason to reassemble those in any way, then it can do that, and that process of reassembly is called salvage. And so salvage um, is a mechanism that cells uh, actually use a fair amount for nucleotides. And you might wonder, well, why are they salvaging things? And one of the reasons that they're salvaging is if we look at things like RNA, for example, RNA uh, in a cell has a transient existence. DNA is permanent, but RNA is transient. So cells make RNA for a period of time, and then they decide, hey, um, I don't need to have this message here anymore, and they break it back down. Well, when they break it down, they're breaking it down to individual nucleotides, and then the cell has a decision, do I break it down further into components, or do I use those to remake, uh, for example, uh, new nucleotides for making new RNA? So that's <clears throat> something we won't go into here, but uh, that is why salvage is a very important consideration. Well, uh, talking about the uh, catabolism then of purine nucleotides, um, we're starting over here on the left with what I describe as RNA or DNA. DNA not commonly is broken down, although if a cell, for example, were to encounter a DNA molecule and internalize it, and yes, cells can do that, then the cell would be breaking down DNA uh, in that case and perhaps using nucleotides for that purpose. That's a fairly common thing for bacteria to do, actually. So they can internalize DNA molecules. It's the basis of um, biotechnology, putting uh, DNAs into bacterial cells and having bacteria make things that we want them to make. Well, however it got in there, that RNA or DNA is broken down by either uh, enzymes known as RNases, which break down RNA, or nucleases, which break down DNA. Um, DNA nucleases are oftentimes referred to as DNases, just like RNases are enzymes that break down RNA, DNases are enzymes that break down DNA. Well, the upshot of breaking down a nucleic acid into its components results in the production of nucleoside monophosphates, and in this case, we're interested in the uh, purine nucleoside monophosphates, which would be GMP or AMP, and in this particular one, we're following the uh, GMP breakdown. So here's our GMP that has resulted from the action, in this case, of an RNase, because this is a ribonucleotide. And we can see um, the uh, components, the base, the sugar, and the phosphate there. The next step, in fact, for the guanine nucleotides, it's pretty uh, simple. The next step in the process is uh, the splitting apart of the, um, uh, first of all, taking the phosphate off, so it's a nucleotidase that clips the phosphate off of that, leaving you with a nucleoside, because remember, a nucleoside doesn't have any phosphate. And then that nucleoside is taken apart into bases and sugars. There are a variety of enzymes that will do that, and there's one right there. 
And since I'm not going to name that, you won't have to know the name of that enzyme. Okay? So, uh, but suffice it to say that we've started with a, um, a GMP and we've broken it down into constituent base and sugar. The sugar in this case is ribose 1-phosphate, the base of course um, being guanine. And these can then be recycled. Guanine could be used to uh, put onto another um, ribose uh, through a salvage pathway that I'll show you very briefly. Uh, ribose 1-phosphate can be converted into ribose. It could also be converted into ribose 5-phosphate so that a different base, for example, could be put onto it. And uh, then, of course, salvage would occur uh, in that way as well. If we look at the um, catabolism of the adenine nucleotides, we see it's a little bit more complicated, but the same basic idea is holding here. We have an RNA or a DNA. In this case, uh, we're following an RNA, so I've got an RNA. And the fact that there's no DNA down here just simply means I didn't put it down there because I just started with an RNA, but a DNA would break down DNA. If we broke down uh, DNA, instead of having AMP or GMP up there, we would have DAMP or DGMP because, of course, those, are, uh, those both have deoxy sugars. So I'm only following the uh, ribonucleotides. Uh, breakdown of that to um, AMP would result, just like we saw before, you would have that nucleoside monophosphate. Now, adenine tends to be a little bit more complicated in its breakdown pathway, and I'm not showing you a whole bunch of stuff here to get you to memorize a whole bunch of different pathways. But I think if you understand the overall basic thing that's happening, uh, you understand this sufficiently. If we think of the basic things that are happening, they're just like the basic things that were happening on the last slide. There's just a couple of uh, intermediate steps. So we had the phosphate, we had a nucleotidase that took off that last phosphate that gave us a nucleoside. And that nucleoside uh, can be broken down into a couple of uh, pieces. Okay? Now, in the case of adenine, we see that the breakdown of the adenosine yields us something that doesn't yield us free adenine. And that's because we can uh, oxidize through a deamination reaction over here to uh, release inosine, which is a purine-like base. Or we can uh, make uh, that into hypoxanthine, uh, as you see here. Hypoxanthine turns out, as we will see, to be important for uh, salvage uh, reactions. And the upshot being that we get a sugar and we get a base or a base-like molecule, uh, in this case hypoxanthine or uh, the uh, inosine, mono, uh, I'm sorry, the inosine which uh, contains the sugar uh, here. Let's see, what else do I want to say here? Um, the bottom line being that the products over here are a base and a sugar. That's, what, that's the bottom line to take away. Okay? So, RNA to a monophosphate, monophosphate to a nucleoside, okay? nucleoside down to a base and a sugar. If we go this route, which I haven't said anything about, if we go through this route, it's just simply changing the order of those steps, okay, which we're not really concerned about. The bottom line being that we're getting a base and a sugar. The base being hypoxanthine, however, is an important base to know. So that's the ultimate uh, breakdown product of the adenosine nucleotides. That's the ultimate base breakdown product that we get. I'm oh, sorry? Yeah, good question. Is the IMP that I, that's in this figure up here the same as the precursor of the AMP and the GMP? And the answer is yes, it is. So you could take, a cell could take, for example, this IMP, and it could make it back into either AMP or GMP. So this would be a way for a cell to take AMP and convert it into GMP if it decided to do that. So yeah, it, cells have a lot of flexibility with this, and again, it's why this regulation and control of the balance is important. The cell doesn't want to be doing you know, conversion of AMP into GMP willy-nilly. Uh, it wants to do it with some sort of balance. But yes, that's exactly the same molecule. OK. Um, now, um, hypoxanthine comes into play when we look um, at the further breakdown. Okay, so when we look at the further breakdown of purine nucleotides, we see that purine nucleotides go through the formation of this molecule 
of uric acid. So we can see hypoxanthine coming from the uh, adenine nucleotides on the left, or we can see guanine uh, coming in through here. They both filter through um, uric acid. Cells break down uric acid, okay, uh, ultimately uh, to carbon dioxide, or they can be excreted also. Now, in animals like birds, for example, uric acid is a primary excretion product for nitrogen. Okay? We excrete urea in our uh, urine as our primary means of getting rid of nitrogen, but birds uh, excrete uric acid. We make uric acid. We make uric acid as a result of purine metabolism. And there's a problem associated with that. <clears throat> the problem is that uric acid is not very water soluble. It's not very water soluble. So what happens with uric acid for people who accumulate uric acid, and that's not an uncommon thing, what will happen is because it's not soluble in water, it will form crystals. And it will form crystals in nerve cells. And the place where it will do that is in the lowest place in your body. I think I may have mentioned this earlier in class. The lowest place in your body being your big toe. And um, it forms extremely painful um, uh, problems as a result of that. The formation of crystals of uric acid, as I've described, um, in nerve cells in your big toe and also in a few other places um, is known as gout. So gout is a disease of purine metabolism where excess uric acid crystallizes and causes problems. Gout is treated, as I will show you in a second, by a drug called allopurinol and the incidence of gout problems uh, has gone down quite a bit as a result of that. This enzyme here, and notice this enzyme is an unusual enzyme. Xanthine oxidase catalyzes two different reactions. It catalyzes this reaction and it catalyzes this reaction. And by inhibiting xanthine oxidase, what one does is it eliminates the formation or strongly or greatly reduces the formation of uric acid. What that means is that the cells, instead of accumulating uric acid, start accumulating guanine and hypoxanthine. What do you suppose will happen if cells start accumulating guanine and hypoxanthine? What are you going to favor? A word I've already used. Salvage. You're going to favor salvage. Because now, instead of you have no other way to get rid of these, when they start accumulating, the salvage pathways start kicking in, <clears throat> and you start making these back into nucleotides. Now, gout was known as a rich man's disease when it occurred many years ago, because the only people who got gout were people who had relatively rich diets. Um, they were people who ate a lot of red meat. Kings got gout, for example. Peasants didn't get gout because they didn't eat a lot of red meat. And they also, uh, kings also drank a lot of red wine, both of which are rich in purine nucleotides. So one of the things or one of the treatments for gout is reducing uh, consumption of red wine and also red meat um, as a consequence. Okay. Um, Oh, one of the things I was going to say about this. So uric acid uh, crystal crystallizing forms gout. Gout is interesting disease in the sense that there appears to be a negative correlation between gout and multiple sclerosis. That is, people who have gout tend not to have multiple sclerosis. And it's not completely understood why that's the case. One line of thinking is that uric acid may be acting something like an antioxidant and preventing some kinds of oxidative damage that ultimately lead to multiple sclerosis. But that's uh, uh, theoretical at this point and it's not completely understood. Okay, there's allopurinol. So allopurinol on the right, xanthine on the left. You see that they look very, very similar to each other. That means that allopurinol is a competitive inhibitor of xanthine oxidase. Xanthine oxidase being that enzyme that I showed you that catalyzed two different reactions. 
So competitive inhibitors always look like the normal substrate, and that's the case here uh, for allopurinol. Okay. Um, now, if we think instead of uh, breaking down purines to their constituent components, and instead think about the salvage of those components, we get to something that looks like this. So um, free adenine uh, can be combined with phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, that's that PRPP that we talked about before that was found in both the de novo, and, I'm sorry, in both the purine and pyrimidine de novo pathways. And we see that PRPP also plays a role, <coughs> excuse me, in the salvage pathways. So free adenine plus PRPP will lead to the formation of AMP. Free guanine plus PRPP will lead to the formation of GMP. And free hypoxanthine, which comes from the pathway that I just showed you, plus PRPP will lead to IMP. And there's that IMP again. Well, we know, of course, what IMP leads to. IMP leads to either AMP or GMP. Now the first enzyme up here, I'm not going to talk about, but the second enzyme and the third enzyme, which are the same, I will talk about. This enzyme is known as hypoxanthine phosphoribosyl transferase, I'm sorry, hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl hyper, hypo, <laughs> ribosyl transferase, I can't even say it myself, which is why we call it HGPRT. Okay. HGPRT is an enzyme that is deficient in the genetic disease known as Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. Okay. Lesch-Nyhan syndrome, uh, people who have this disease lack this enzyme and are unable to salvage, do either of these reactions below. It would seem to be a relatively minor uh, thing to have happen, but the disease itself is very devastating. It causes a bizarre neurological problem in which people with this disease eat their lips. Yes. That, I hear that. And that always happens whenever I announce that. They, will, they literally will eat their fingers, they will eat their lips, and they have to be restrained because they will um, tend to do that. It's not known why uh, they do it, but it is due to the fact that they are deficient in this enzyme. So a very bizarre uh, type of genetic uh, disease. Okay. Um, it's called Lesch-Nyhan syndrome, this thing right here at the bottom. Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. HG, I said the question was what was the abbreviation for the enzyme? The answer is HGPRT. Hypoxanthine guanine phosphorebacil transferase. I got it right without looking at it, okay? HGPRT. Okay, so um, let's see. There's our summary. Um, catalytic, uh, catalytic and salvage pathways. Uh, uh, oh, let's see, I'm sorry, am I skipping, to the, skipping the pyrimidines? Oh, this, okay, I guess I've got the summary in the wrong place. Okay, the um, easy can, I do have that in the wrong place. All right, then I'll come back to that. Sorry about that. I didn't realize that until just now. The pyrimidine. Uh, summary is, is not where it should be there. Well, let's talk about uh, pyrimidine salvage. And pyrimidine salvage looks really big and hairy, and I'm going to keep it simple for you. Okay? So we are not going to memorize this pathway, but I sure these pathways because there's multiple uh, things that are going on here. I've drawn some arrows in this pathway to show you the general direction of things happening. So, for example, if I go from left to right, I'm doing salvage, meaning I'm grabbing pieces, and there's a piece right there. There's uridine. That's a nucleoside. There's cytidine. That's a nucleoside. If I start putting phosphates onto there, I can make the corresponding UTP or the CTP. So in going from left to right on this figure, I'm going from nucleosides to nucleoside triphosphates, and that's a salvage process. On the other hand, if I start on the right and I move to the left, I go from triphosphates back to nucleosides, and no surprise, that's the opposite. So that would be breakdown. And the breakdown products here are leading to cytidine and to uridine. 
If I go up and down, okay, then what's happening is I'm interconverting cyt uh, cytosine containing uh, nucleosides and uracil containing nucleosides, that is uridine, cytidine. Okay? So by going up and down, I interconvert between U's and C's, basically. Right? And when we look at it in this way, we see that there is a lot of flexibility of converting and interconverting both nucleosides and nucleotides as well as U's and C's. And that's true whether they are U's and C's that are in this case as triphosphates or U's and C's whether they are in, as nucleosides. So there's a lot of flexibility in pyrimidine nucleotide metabolism as it relates to salvage. Now pyrimidine nucleotide metabolism can lead to um, a variety of uh, products and no we're not going to learn the uh, structures of any of those but I will point out that uh, the upshot is that these very big molecules can ultimately be broken down into ammonium ion and to carbon dioxide and as we will see later in the term when I talk about uh, nitrogen metabolism at the very end of the term that ammonia and ammonium ions are toxic to cells so it's very important for cells to be able to handle and deal with those toxic compounds and that's the reason why excretion of nitrogen containing compounds is important okay excretion is important so we use as I said urea and there's you can see this leading to urea synthesis we excrete urea as a way of getting rid of excess nitrogen containing compounds and birds um, use uric acid and other animals, some animals like fish, excrete ammonia directly. That's why you've got to clean the fish tank out periodically because it gets a little rank. Okay? One other thing I've, I didn't mention, and this is a kind of an interesting thing. Anybody here have Dalmatian dog? Nobody has a Dalmatian dog. Dalmatian dogs are one of the exceptions to the rule about uric acid. Dalmatian dogs have a mutation. They don't excrete urea. They actually excrete uric acid. And Dalmatian dogs, as a consequence, have a lot more pain associated with them than do other dogs because what happens is the uric acid crystallizes in their joints like it crystallizes in our big toe and causes them pain. So anybody who's ever had a Dalmatian dog uh, knows that they spend a fair amount more time taking the dog to the veterinarian because the dog just doesn't seem to be right. And the answer is it's making too much uric acid uh, that it uh, is not excreting uh, sufficiently. Okay. There's overall, it's like I should have swapped those two. I'll make sure I get those two swapped back and forth. So, okay. All right, questions about that before I move to deoxyribonucleotide metabolism? No? Well, um, deoxyribonucleotide metabolism is interesting um, and it's different, okay? So deoxyribonucleotide metabolism happens as a result of reduction of nucleoside diphosphates. I'll repeat that. Deoxyribonucleotide metabolism happens as a result of reduction of diphosphates. Uh, of rib ribonucleoside diphosphates, okay? So for example, GDP, CDP, ADP, and UDP are precursors of DGDP, DCDP, DADP, and DUDP. And notice I haven't said anything about DTDP. That comes later, okay? So the starting material for making deoxyribonucleotides is ribonucleoside diphosphate molecules. Okay. So we can see one of those reactions occurring here. There's CDP getting converted to DCDP. And this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme known as ribonucleotide reductase. And just like there was one enzyme that catalyzed the conversion 
of all the diphosphates to all the triphosphates, that was NDPK, there's only one enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of ribonucleoside diphosphates into deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates, and that's ribonucleotide reductase. Now I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about this enzyme because it's an interesting enzyme and we're going to see some interesting and unusual regulation of this enzyme not like we've seen before. Okay? Um, and it all is built around the theme that I've been talking about with nucleotide metabolism of balance. Balance. Okay? So, um, there's the overall reaction. And if we look at what's happening here, we see that the enzyme is existing in two states, a reduced state and an oxidized state. And so whenever you see an enzyme existing in two states, that should tell you that you have a ping pong mechanism. Okay? It's also called double displacement reactions. And this enzyme is an example of that. The upshot of this reaction is the release of water, the production of a deoxyribonucleoside diphosphate, and uh, the enzyme has to be um, uh, um, reduced, ultimately. How the, that's how the, the overall process starts. Well, how does the enzyme get reduced to start with? It gets reduced by action um, of a molecule called thioredoxin. Thioredoxin provides electrons necessary to reduce ribonucleotide reductase. And where does thioredoxin get reduced from? It gets reduced ultimately from NADPH. And this is a very uh, involved process. I'm not going to show you that. And this is only for that very first reduction of the ribonucleotide reductase. As I will show you, this reaction sort of propagates itself through the ping pong mechanism once everything has gotten started. And we'll see that happening in just a minute. Okay. Well, let's um, take a look at the enzyme itself. Ribonucleotide reductase, you can abbreviate RNR if you wish. And ribonucleotide reductase has a large subunit. Okay. Large subunit has two allosteric sites and it also has the active site of the enzyme. So you haven't seen enzymes that have two completely different allosteric sites yet, and this is one that has that. And we'll see what roles they play in controlling this overall enzyme. The, small sub, uh, the, the large subunit is known as R1. The small subunit is known as R2. And it's in the R2 that something called a tyrosine radical that I'm going to show you in just a minute. A tyrosine radical is created that is necessary for the mechanism of this reaction. Okay? Now what's interesting is that the active site of the enzyme is in the large subunit, but the reaction actually starts in the small subunit. And so what's happening here is we have electronic changes that are being communicated across the subunits. Okay? It's a very, if you want a, a good example of proteins acting like electronic circuits, this is a really good example of one. Okay? It acts like an electronic circuit. Now the last point up here that I've mentioned already is that RNR controls the balance of deoxyribonucleotides and of course if there's something that the cell wants to control the balance of properly, this is really high on the list because mutations in making RNA are not nearly as consequential as mutations in making DNA. RNA isn't around forever. You destroy RNA, okay, you made a mutation in it, it's gone. You make a mutation in DNA and it is around forever. So keeping that balance of deoxyribonucleotides at the proper levels is very, very important. Okay. RNR is a dimer of dimers, meaning that it has two subunits and each subunit contains one R1 subunit and one R2 subunit. You can see that the two allosteric sites are shown in blue and in yellow. Okay? And I call them the specificity site as shown here, the yellow one I call the activity site. And that sometimes is confusing for students. The activity site is not the same as the active site. 
So activity controls activity. Active site is where the reaction is catalyzed. And I'll, and I'll uh, show you that distinction in just a minute. OK. Now I'm going to show you something that's hopefully not going to throw panic into you. Uh, but it is a mechanism. It's the mechanism by which this enzyme works. I'm not going to expect you to memorize this mechanism. I'm going to show you some general features of the mechanism that I think you should know. But I'm not going to say, hey, redraw that mechanism on the exam, because that would just be kind of dumb to do. Okay? Well, in this reaction, or in these reactions that you can see on the screen, we have several things that are happening. First of all, we have a target molecule, which is shown over here on the right. This is our ribonucleoside diphosphate. And the enzyme is shown here in this part up here. Okay? Now this enzyme has already been activated by that thyro uh, thyroredoxin uh, that I've talked about because it's in the reduced form and it has a uh, tyrosyl radical. Okay? So we can see that this guy has been reduced because it has sulfhydryls and it has a tyrosyl radical. It means basically it has an unpaired electron, and that electron doesn't show up very well, but if you look very carefully, you'll see there's a little blue dot right there, meaning it has an unpaired electron. That's the radical that we're talking about. So it starts with a reduced RNR having a tyrosyl radical. Yes, that's an important consideration. Okay. Now I'm going to talk through a couple of the steps that I'm not going to hold you responsible for, but just to show you how this thing proceeds. Okay? The tyrosyl uh, radical, um, let's see, let me get, get this uh, right. The tyrosyl radical will actually pull a proton. And the proton it pulls is this proton right here on carbon number three. If you look at ribose, you should, uh, the ribose sugar uh, of this uh, overall uh, nucleotide. If you look at the ribose, you'll see that the base is attached to carbon number one. This hydrogen and oxygen is carbon number two. This guy here is carbon number three, and then four and five. The hydrogen is pulled off of carbon number three, okay? And it's pulled off by the tyrosyl radical. That leaves behind a radical on the sugar, all right? In addition to that, that, um, uh, let's see, what do I want to say here? That um, reduced sulfhydryl that's right here donates an, uh, a proton to the hydroxyl on carbon number two. And it's on carbon number two where most of the action is going to occur here. That creates um, a positively charged water molecule that is um, on that um, ribose ring. Okay? Well, that water wants to leave very quickly, and in fact it does leave, and leaves behind now this um, unusual structure here that you see for the ribose. This unusual structure is a target for the other proton that's on the reduced sulfhydryl of the RNR enzyme, and creates this guy down here. Now, what I've just told you are things I don't expect that you're going to regurgitate to me. I'm just showing you how that process happens. However, the product of this, I do think that you should know. And the product is that you have an oxidized RNR molecule. Okay? You have an oxidized RNR molecule. And you remember that up here we pulled a hydrogen okay, off. The hydrogen we pulled off in that tyrosine is still sitting right here. <clears throat> that hydrogen is donated back to this radical site, leaving us with a molecule that is lacking a hydroxyl at position two. So this is a deoxyribonucleoside diphosphate at this point. Now, I'm going to summarize for you what I've just told you. Okay. The summary is that we start with the ribonucleoside diphosphate. We start with the enzyme in the reduced state with an, with, um, um, an activated tyrosine, okay? or a tyrosine radical. The tyrosine radical grabs a proton that's used later. Okay? 
there are some molecular rearrangements that happen that result in the oxidation of the RNR enzyme and the donation of that hydrogen back to the ribose yielding a deoxyribonucleoside sugar and the enzyme in the oxidized radical form. How is that going to get reduced? Thioredoxin. It's going to get reduced by thioredoxin. And so now we can see the enzyme in the two states. Remember the ping pong. We see the enzyme in the reduced state on the top. We see it in the oxidized state below. Yes, this is a complicated mechanism, but if you know it in the summary fashion that I just gave to you, you know as much as you need to know about that mechanism. Now, what happens when we get the ribonucleoside diphosphate? How do we get it into the ribonucleoside triphosphate? Anybody? How do you add a phosphate? NDPK, because NDPK converts all of the diphosphates into triphosphates. It works on the ribonucleoside diphosphates. It also works on the deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates. Okay? Now, somebody asked me um, after class here, there's a very good question. And the question was, well, if you have NDPK for making triphosphates, why do you need to have oxidative phosphorylation? I'll throw that out at you. And I'll ask the person I told the answer to that to, to not say what the answer is. Okay? Why do you need oxidative phosphorylation if you've got NDPK? Any thoughts? Nobody? Yes? So she says for regulation. No, it turns out NDPK isn't very regulated. Okay? There's something that, uh, this is a sort of a trick question. Okay? So I'm going to ask it to you here, not on the exam. Or maybe I'll ask it on the exam. If I tell you the answer, then maybe you know it on the exam, right? Okay? Um, the answer to the question is that there's no net gain of triphosphates here. Because it takes a triphosphate to convert one of the diphosphates into a triphosphate. So for example, if I had, let's say, DCDP, and I wanted to make DCTP, NTPK would catalyze that, but it would need an energy source. And the energy source most commonly is ATP. So I'd be gaining one triphosphate and losing the other triphosphate, so there would be no net gain of triphosphates. Whereas oxidative phosphorylation is giving us a net gain of triphosphates every time the, th the turbine spins. Right? So that's the answer to the question. But it's a very good question. OK. Well, I've said the mechanism. Now let's talk about the unusual regulation scheme that ribonucleotide reductase uses. OK? Ribonucleotide reductase has, as I described it, two allosteric sites and one active site. The active site is shown on the right side here, and yes, we're looking at the R1 subunit, the large subunit that has all of these components. Okay. The active site is where the reaction is catalyzed. And the, rea better, the active site is the site that will bind diphosphates, UDP, CDP, ADP, and GDP. And I've colored them the way I've colored them on purpose. Okay? Before I show you the corresponding uh, colors up here, let me talk about the simple allosteric site. The simple allosteric site is basically an on-off switch for the enzyme. Binding of ATP at the activity site turns the enzyme on. Binding of DATP at the activity site turns the enzyme off. So green for go, red for stop. Okay? So it's an on-off. If DATP is bound, nothing else matters. The enzyme is turned off. If ATP is bound, the enzyme is turned on. Well, think about this. This makes good sense. ATP, 
high levels of ribonucleotides, ATP, high levels of energy, high levels of energy, cells want to make whoopee. Yes? Oh, they, you are. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes. ATP activates it. You know, we had a pro I thought I fixed that. We had a problem with that, and I, I think I had the wrong colors, and I didn't change the words. I apologize. So, yes, you're, you're right. That should, say, that should say activate and inactivate, and I'll, and I'll fix that. Sorry about that. Okay, now that you're totally confused, all right? ATP, ribonucleotides, plenty of ribonucleotides if it binds. ATP, plenty of energy. Cell wants to make whoopee. So if it wants to make whoopee, it's going to need deoxyribonucleotides. Turning the enzyme on makes good sense. So ATP is an activator of the enzyme, makes good sense. On the other hand, DATP means the cell's got plenty of deoxyribonucleotides. You don't want to be making additional deoxyribonucleotides if you have plenty, and consequently this turns the enzyme off. All right. Well, that's a pretty simple thing. How about this other allosteric site? The other allosteric site is what I call the substrate specificity site. Now this site modulates the activity of the enzyme. It modulates it, meaning that binding of things here at the substrate specificity site influences which substrates will bind at the active site. I'll say that again. The substrate specificity site modulates which substrates will bind at the activities, at the active site. I'm sorry, now I'm saying the wrong thing myself, right? So for example, let's look at the browns, DATP and ATP. You would say, well, those are both purines. And if we look over here, what do binding of purines and the substrate specificity favor? They favor the binding of pyrimidines. There's a nice complementarity there. If we have too many purines, we want to have more pyrimidines. Okay? If we look at the um, uh, DTTP, okay, we see a, pyr a, a, a pyrimidine favors the binding of purine. Now, the only one that's out of whack is this guy right here. Binding of DGTP favors the binding of ADP over here. It may be providing a little bit of balance between ADP and GDP. I'm sorry, DATP and, and DGTP. And that may not be a minor consideration. And the reason that may not be a minor consideration is cells have artificially high levels of ATP because they use it as gasoline to power everything. ATP is going to be present at higher levels inside of cells. If GTP, in this case of DGTP, gets, levels get too high, it's going to favor the synthesis of more of the other um, purine nucleotide. That's just one thought. If you know that binding of purines at the substrate specificity site favors the binding of pyrimidines and vice versa at the active site, that's all you need to know. You don't need to balance. You don't need to say, oh, DATP did these two, et cetera, OK? Purine triphosphates favor pyrimidine diphosphates, and vice versa. If you know that, for our purposes, we'll call it even. Make sense? But notice, these are triphosphates. These are diphosphates. Notice that these were triphosphates. So the only place you see binding of diphosphates is at the active site of the enzyme. OK? Now, I probably generated some questions with that. So I'll take any questions that you might have. Everybody's fatigued. Okay, well, that is ribonucleotide reductase. Okay. Let's finish today talking about thymidine metabolism. We haven't talked about that yet. Thymidine metabolism. 
I've talked about U, and if you think about it, you can go from UDP to DUDP, but we know there's, that you don't have DUTP in DNA. Okay? So how do we get from U to T? That's really the question. And that's actually shown on this thing right here. The pathway to making U, uh, uh, DTTP is convoluted. Before I go through this, I'll point out something that you'll commonly see in textbooks, and I try to avoid it, and that is that you see DTTP commonly written as TTP. Because people used to say, well, there's no such thing as, a, as ribo TTP. So therefore, saying TTP implies DTTP. And it always causes confusion. So I say, let's just screw that confusion. We're going to call it DTTP. Okay? So I tend to use DTTP, DTDP, DTMP, whereas other books will tend to call it TMP, TDP, and TTP. They're the same thing. Okay, well how do we get to thymidine nucleotides from the uh, uridine nucleotides? Well, we can see that process happening here. Here's the first step in the process, that's the R and R in converting UDP to DUDP. You next see the DUDP converted to DUTP by NTPK. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of NTPK floating around the cell. And it's not easy to turn the enzyme off because you don't want to turn that enzyme off. You got all these other nucleotides you want to put phosphates on, right? So you make DUTP. Well, DUTP is a problem for the cell. And I'll tell you the problem of DUTP for the cell. DNA polymerase recognizes DUTP just like DTTP. DNA polymerase recognizes DUTP just like DTTP, and it will put it into DNA if you let it. Okay? Well, there are problems. I'm not going to talk about them here, but there are problems associated with that. So to keep that from happening, cells have an enzyme called DUTPase that breaks down DUTP into dump, DUMP. And it's DUMP that's used to make the thymidine nucleotides. Dump goes to DTMP. I'll talk about this enzyme in a minute. DTMP goes to DTDP. By there's that monophosphate kinase, each one specific for each nucleotide. And then finally, DTDP goes to DTTP by NDPK. So even though it's a convoluted process, okay, with the exception of this step right here, it's a pretty straightforward one. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the things, let me show you the, the reaction for thymidylic synthase, and then we'll do our song for the day. And that is um, right here. Here's the reaction that thymidylic synthase is catalyzing. There, okay, we can see there's a sugar attached down here. We're just looking at the base. But if we look at uracil up here, part of DUMP, and we compare it to DTMP, the only difference is right there, that methyl group. That methyl group gets donated by a molecule called a folate. Folates are important. We'll see fo uh, folates are uh, vitamin-like molecules that are necessary for things like neural tube development. Deficiency of folates results in uh, unclosed neural tubes during the process of embryogenesis and leads to severe problems. But folates, as we will see, are important for what we call one carbon metabolism, and we can see that one carbon in this case being a methyl group that gets donated. Okay, I'm going to talk more about that next time, but um, I'll talk since we've already been talking, you guys have been getting exams and so forth, I thought it would be appropriate to have a song about testing. Oh no, yes, okay. It's called the mellow woes of testing. Oop, where'd it go? It's not playing. All right, you can sing it with me. How about that? The term is almost at an end, 10 weeks since it began. I worried how my grade was, because I did not have a plan. The first exam went not so well, I got a 63. It was just about the average score in biochemistry. I buckled down the second time, did not sow my wild oats. I downloaded the videos and took a ton of notes. 
I learned about free energy and delta G naught prime. My score increased by seven points. A C plus grade was mine. I sang the songs I memorized. I played the MP3s. I learned the citrate cycle and I counted ATPs. I had electron transport down in all of complex V. I gasped when I saw my exam. It was a 93. So heading to the final stretch, I crammed my memory and came to class on sunny days for quizzing comedy. I packed a card with info and my brain almost burned out. Twas much to my delight, I got the A I dreamed about. So here's the moral of the song, it doesn't pay to stew. If scores are not quite what you want and you don't have a clue, the answers get into your head when you know what to do. Watch videos, read highlights, and review, review, review. All right, guys, see you on Wednesday. <laughs>